I'm not here to talk about me, I'm here to talk a bit about the travel part of it. And obviously we've seen a lot of changes for the last two years, but I'm not going to try to look back too much. What I will say though, is I think you all experienced that travel is back. So from being locked in for two years, I know this is how a lot of your travelers felt like, I personally felt like this a lot, all of a sudden they are free. And I'm sure you have in each of your program, people who say, I want to get back on the road, I want to travel right now, it's safe, I want to do these things. But a lot of things changed as well. I'm going to walk through a little bit of these things, because what we see in the industry today is a lot of actually conflict between some people are super excited about going back to travel, and some people have never been more afraid. And for you as travel managers, obviously that causes a lot of problems. But I'm going to walk through a little bit how we've seen it and some of the feedback we get from you as a customers as well, and a couple of takeaways. Usually when I do this presentation, I walk a lot. Now you're going to see my hands walk much more than actually my legs, so I apologize for that in advance. I'm a little bit of a restless fella. If you look a bit on the recovery, obviously you've seen, and as you heard from Steve, travel is coming back actually with a vengeance. We've tried to summarize a lot of different aspects how people predicted, and this goes back actually to three months, sorry, end of December, how people predicted travel is going to come back. Most of the corporations we speak to today, most of the industry bodies, they do not expect travel to rebound to 100% in the next year or two. Personally, I believe that we have lost 20% of the reasons for trips as we had pre-COVID. The simple some of these aspects where people traveled before, which we're not going to see anymore for these things. However, given the dynamics of the industry, given that the economy is growing overall, we will see travel picking up again. But this obviously causes a few things for you guys and a couple of issues for ourselves as well, and things to think about. One is, this looks very linear as a recovery. I can assure you it's not. So this up demand we're having, we're seeing spikes and then we're seeing valleys in much bigger degree. And why that is causing an issue for the industry is not only for your travel program, for us, how we service this, how we staff this, but more importantly, from the travel providers. So if you're an airline out there, and we have a few in the crowd today, how do you try to meet this demand with supply? They used to try plan a year in advance, maybe two years in advance, how different routes are affected. All this is extremely hard for them to predict. The other part which is very hard to predict is actually if it was the same global picture everywhere, it would be super easy. But each market have its own twists and turns and are very different from these things. Which means again, from a global travel program perspective, for our perspective, it's quite, quite hard to plan. We still see Asia, as you guys most know, is way behind opening borders and travel restriction compared to the Western Europe at the moment. So it's something that we're going to see more and more, I think, in this calendar year, before things become a little bit of that new norm. The last part is also to give you some indication. From February to March, in a three weeks' time, our demand and travel went up more than 50%. And if you think in your own organizations, when you plan for things in advance, you think you have a very good plan, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden you're saying travel is back, is fantastic, but everybody wants to go on a plane at the moment, and everybody have queries. You realize it actually causes a lot of stress in the organization. So also that what I was saying to you guys, we are trying to plan and think ahead a little bit, but it's an industry phenomenon at the moment. How do we plan for these waves, which we haven't seen historically? And what does this mean to you? When you again discuss internally, when you discuss with your colleagues and everything, I'm sure you see a lot of these things. One thing we've seen, and I kind of want to highlight, is for the individual travelers. As I said, we've never seen much more, so much more contrast between travelers in an organization today. They used to, in a pandemic, for example, to be 100% digital. Everybody ordered online because, quite frankly, we couldn't do anything else, and they want to take that into travel. At the same time, we've never had so many offline requests when people are traveling. So there's a little bit of here that, that conflict in terms of some people are very confident, want to deal with it digitally, but we actually have that offline world coming back to it because people are, lo have lost their habits. They've lost their way, their habits, how to travel for these things. So we need to give much more support. And this is something which I think for you from a travel program perspective, and I'm not sure how each one of you have done, 
but I ask you to reflect a little bit how you can cater for these different personalities within your company. So you have the gung-ho traveler, doesn't need assistance, just want to get on the road. Usually there are sales folks, let's face it. They want to see their, their customers. But you also have the people who are very hesitant, who are actually quite comfortable only doing virtual meetings. And again, these influence your travel program. I think the big part is, from a corporate perspective again, the big question that comes up, why do we need to travel? Before COVID, I don't think there was any issues. People knew why they're traveling. There was quite a few reasons for these things. But a lot of things have changed right now with the virtual world, more of a hybrid workforce. The big question we hear is, why do you need to travel anymore? And we believe in travel, obviously. I wouldn't be sitting here otherwise. We believe in face-to-face -face meet face -face meetings we have today give immense amount of value. But it is a balance, and it is a balance from a corporate perspective. How do you balance this cost, the increase in cost that travel eventually means, versus that need to meet? And what we see at the moment, and most of the customers I speak to, is very much depending on your company, your company culture. It doesn't seem to be one single answer, and I can tell you exactly how to do. On the contrary, make sure you align a little bit internal with your organization, what is actually the needs and how you find some of this balance. How do you work with HR to make sure you find that holy grail between that need, the reason for traveling, why you should be traveling and same framework for this, but also linked to the traveler's well-being so that actually they feel comfortable with it. And the last part, which I think we're gonna spend a lot of time today is obviously sustainability. Why travel is also very much linked to sustainability. As late as last night, uh, the American government proposed an act that all companies, or the top large companies in America, need to disclose their sustainability, sustainability impact. And that includes business travel impact. And you know how great we are creating standards about sustainability in the travel industry? We're not, for you who have missed that. I think we have a lot, of a lot of actually work to do here, but also for you internally to speak with your corporations. Last trend I'm going to pick up on as well is that for the last 18 to 20 more months, obviously, we've done virtual events. And we know how much we love to hate them, let's be frank. They have not been fantastic. But coming back right now, meetings will be slightly different. Expectations are slightly different. Most corporations we spoke to before actually had a bit of Wild West regarding meeting events. It was not fully structured, let's face it. Business travel, you guys have a control over. Meeting events, maybe not so much. And we see huge demand right now actually to mix a bit more how meeting events can be subject to the same reasons, to the same actually criteria for duty of care as the normal travel. So just to say some of the feedback we see for the customers. But from an industry perspective, I think the last 12 months or 14 months, 18 months, whatever that time period was, I keep forgetting, it's actually had some profound impacts for this. And some of these things is going to have an impact on you guys and the travel program. First of all, travel industry used to have a fantastic dilemma. People wanted to work in travel. It was glamorous. People loved travel. You can see people. You can meet people. But at the moment, not so much. So there's been a talent drain in the industry overall. You can speak to all our supplier partners, you can speak to all the TMCs, the colleagues, but in every part, we actually lost a bit of talent. So as an industry, we have a bit of mission to make it attractive again. There's also been two main factors. A, increased consolidation. I think you've seen a lot of acquisitions, you've seen a lot of consolidation in industry, but that also means there's gonna be a lot of new innovations for this. And it's something we monitor very closely regarding innovation. How can we bring more innovation into this new world? I can't tell you exactly how travel is going to look like in three years' time, but I know it's going to be different. And I know a lot of this is going to be driven by innovations, by startups as well. And it's something also I recommend you to endorse in your travel program, how you can incorporate innovation into a traditional travel program. For the suppliers, I mentioned before, it is a nightmare for them to match demand and supply. But that's also why you see, and I'm sure you all experience this when your travelers want to get on the road, airline prices are a slight bit higher than before. And when I say slight, I mean they're enormously more expensive. <laughs> and there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, all airlines are in massive debt. They never had that issue before, but they need to actually pay back that debt. The second part is putting out that capacity, not knowing if people are gonna travel, is extremely inefficient. So I don't blame them for saying, actually, I need to make sure these flights are actually uh, a return on investment for me, and they're actually profitable for me as a company as well. But again, from a travel program perspective, that causes a bit of issue, because the prices overall in 2022, we predict is gonna be increasingly high until they start to go down, and we see a bit more that demand and supply predictions to a pre-COVID world for it. 
And obviously, airlines, they are gung-ho, as you can hear a bit later on today, about NDC, about retailing, and they also want to reduce the cost regarding payments. And why I'm bringing this topic up is not because something's going to change tomorrow, but in two to three years' time, there's going to be some significant changes in how we manage payment in the airline industry today. Just so you give you guys a heads up, because the cost for the airline industry for payments is around 8 billion US dollars per year. And if you see an airline who's looking after the cost at the moment, they're very, very keen to decrease that 8 billion US dollars they as an industry have. So there's going to be some changes here as well. Sustainability. Yes. If airlines don't become sustainable, if providers don't become sustainable, I don't sure, I'm not sure we're going to have much travel in the future. It's a massive point for them as well. Last but not least, it's a gun from us from a Team C perspective. As mentioned, we have a bit of a talent drain as an industry. Obviously, they expect, that is affecting every single Team C today. So it's not only us, I'll be very transparent. We are trying to ramp up as much as we can. It used to be easy to recruit people. Now we have to work even harder. I think we are pretty good at these things, but again, it takes a bit longer than it has historically for these things. And we also, with this unpredictable demand, need to be able to better meet those peaks and the ebbs as well for this. So that's a little bit what you're gonna see. We're working on our side and then come to a few aspects, how we invest to better cater for that service for you guys. And last but not least, how can we help you to become more sustainable? We are doing our part. We're really trying to increase our sustainability footprint and actually driving towards a net zero. But more importantly, we're here to try to help you guys to have a net zero program. Again, not going to happen overnight, but it's a pathway which I think we all need to take very seriously at the moment. There are going to be questions at the end, but if anybody has some burning topics, just raise a hand. I, I can't hand the mic to you guys, but someone maybe can do that. Right, it's quickly, I have a few more minutes left. Just a little bit of, about us and seeing a little bit for this. We released our half-year update, uh, financial update, as Steve was mentioning as well. There's a couple of things I just want to highlight there for you guys. Number one, our commitment to you guys is to make sure we're going to be a continuous business moving forward. And as something from a financial stability perspective, we still make sure we are. So we have more than one billion in liquid assets at the moment to make sure that we can continue to invest, to service you, but be there for the long time. For the CSO perspective, we have appointed a CSO. We take sustainability very seriously within FCM. That is something actually you're going to see our journey accelerate quite significant. We have commitment to the SPTIs as well at the moment, and you're soon going to hear our net zero pledge as well. We just want to make sure that is fully aligned and endorsed with the plan behind it, and not something I'm making up on stage. In terms of our global footprint of this, I think you, most of you are aware we have expanded geographically during this and we actually open up our own business in FCM Japan, which is one of the largest travel markets. And why we've done this? Because we see a great opportunity to be the alternative player in Japan. It's a fairly traditional travel market. I know many of you have uh, travelers there, you have uh, operations there as well. And we think we can actually propose something slightly different than market and therefore we've done that investment. And we have a couple of more to come as well, which I can't fully reveal in this public but uh, over a beer in a couple of weeks, I'm very happy to reveal everything for you. We continue to also grow our customer base. Obviously, we're most proud of the retention aspect. Uh, thank you all of you who trust, you, trust us with your business. We are very, very eager to make sure there's a long-term relationship for this. And we're looking at a retention figure, which is above 98%, which is probably the one who is, I'm most proud of. And just want to say many thank you to you all. But we're also getting more customers coming on board, couple of reasons for this, but actually for the last uh, 12 months, we have signed up more than 2.3 billion Australian dollars in business in real money, US dollars, that means about 1.7, 1.8 billion US dollars. And why that is important for you is obviously to say, we want to grow. And we definitely want to grow together with existing customers, but also new customers means we can invest more and enhance your programs as well. So it's actually having that good balance for these things. Last but not least, I'm not going to go all this because I'm way over time already. I know that. And we're going to have some time for Q&As if one know. We have set out, and some of you have seen this before, our key investment areas for this. And you're going to hear about this throughout the day a bit more in depth. 
Content is obviously fundamental to us. And you probably saw an announcement we did last week that we're taking a majority stake in an air aggregator called TP Connects. And it's really there to say, if the GDSs, for example, can't provide the right content, we want to have the flexibility our safe to control this and provide you with better savings and better content. So it's a strategic investment we've done as a group, which obviously is going to benefit you guys as well. I know you all love data. It's, it's uh, you know, everybody's favorite topic to have and not talk about in detail. But we are investing enormously into this. We're also updating our user interface. And number one objective is to have, make sure we have the best quality data in the industry. We are not there today, but it's a continuous journey we want to drive towards and that's our strategic objective and investment for it. Sustainability, you're going to hear a lot about today, uh, but we have some more capabilities, not only what we are doing, but how we can help you as well. Part being advice and see how you can implement that into your program. I think Joe may touch upon it afterwards, but also in terms of how we can potentially influence behavior with some of the tools that we have now at our disponibility. Operation excellence, I mentioned that we have been a talent drain in the industry overall. We are investing heavily in our people to make sure we're an attractive place to work, making sure you have the service that you do deserve, but also making sure we can digitalize our service much more. A lot of people, as I said, in this COVID environment want to do things a bit more self-service, and we love that, but we always want to have support behind the scenes if someone wants to call. So finding that approach is we're really making a hyper-investment at the moment, which you're going to see materialize for the next year or two, actually. Last but not least, I'm sure you're going to hear a little about tech today. We also launched our new FCM platform, which is really, again, meant for me, giving a great user experience, but also flexibility and tailored to your travel programs as well. And we also have done a bit of acquisition on the side for a small company called Shep. But Shep is really what we talked about before. They help to drive innovation in a corporate travel program. So they will actually help us to influence on third-party websites some of the information that you usually have in the FCM platform. So, for example, for a Concur user, we can now actually propose messages or a different aspect on a Concur user interface without ruining the Concur booking experience, which you have implemented today. So, given us increased capabilities to actually interact with the travelers, and for you, increased capabilities to also influence your travelers and their programs. That's my rapid fire. Three key takeaways, which you're going to hear, to hear a lot about today. A, sustainability. And after today, I hope you can look back and lead to saying, how do you deal with sustainability within your travel program? But also, how can we deal with it from an industry perspective? I am adamant that unless the industry is taught to take this seriously, business travel will never return to more than 50% of the levels, because we have a lot of work to do. Now, the airlines are starting to realize it, hotels are starting to realize it, but I'm asking you as buyers, the more you can push them in the right direction, we're happy to help that as well. I think we're going to have a sustainable industry moving forward, but we need to start to take action right now. The second part of it is within your travel programs, and we're going to have some topics about that afterwards. What does travel right mean for you as an organization? And is that balance between cost, between the traveler well-being, and between the sustainability part of it? Where in that beautiful triangle, if you look at these as a point ends, would you sit yourself as a corporation? And why do I think that's important for you to be able to articulate? It because your management and your CFOs, they will come to ask you these questions. So have a think about it during today. I hope that some of these debates we're going to have today are going to stimulate some of these things. Maybe not give you the answer, but again, we're happy to advise afterwards. And last but not least, I know it may not be all your scope into the remit for your travel programs today, but meeting events coming back. And again, you, from our point of view, are a strategic advisor to your corporations how meeting and events can best take place because you know how to do travel in your organizations. 